Welcome to the Kennedy Report. I'm Kennedy Hall. Boca and I are here to help today, and uh, we're going to get to the topic here quickly in a second. First, like this video, subscribe to this channel. Links in the description. You know the deal. You've watched a billion YouTube videos. Do the things YouTubers tell you to do. Like button, subscribe button, notification bell, so on and so forth. Okay. The other day, Bishop TCA was here giving some confirmations. Finally, the bishops can come into the country because of the world. And he gave a sermon uh, for the confirmations. And he said, I won't do his accent, even though I probably could. He said, um, he actually sounded like Marcel Lefebvre when he spoke. He had the same kind of uh, sort of high registered French accent. It was interesting. But he said, uh, when you are confirmed, you are not, you are a soldier of Christ. This is something everybody knows. Even, even in the Novus Order, we say this. We're a soldier of Christ. But he said, soldiers don't just defend, they attack. You don't just defend the church in the passive sense. You attack enemies of the church in the active and positive sense. This is what soldiers do. If there's someone doing something unjust, if there's someone doing something that's wrong, if there's someone doing something that harms the church, then if you can, you attack them. This is what soldiers do. This is the Catholic faith, ladies and gentlemen. You don't see in the past these theologians going, well... You know, so-and-so is out there spreading heresies. I'll just have a dialogue with them. No, they write a book. They write a series of books. They do orations in public, uh, whatever. They go on and on the attack against a person who is an enemy of the faith. Michael Lofton is an enemy of the church, and here's why I'm going to say that. He recently released a uh, stupid um, uh, thing about Marcel Lefebvre, which is just completely incorrect. I'm going to bring that up here in just a second. And But this is not the reason. This is not the only problem. Um, you know, I've had my fair share of, uh, intentions to dialogue with the Novus Ordo crowd. I have tried to download our di dialogue with the Novus Ordo types and so forth. And some of them have been very amenable, but some of them have been extremely uncharitable. Michael often is one of those. He's basically someone who's decided to go after every single traditionalist on earth. And he is actually spreading lies about Marcel Lefebvre. We're going to get to one of those in just a second. But uh, while I find that image, uh, go. Why don't you tell us your thoughts on the situation? Uh, well, first thing I thought was that the man is, as I've thought in general, is that the man is dishonest. Uh, all, all he's been doing uh, for a while now is seeing what popes are saying, uh, popes are doing, and interpreting things, quote unquote, charitably and putting down this hermeneutic of his quote hermeneutic of suspicion that he that he has invented that uh doesn't exist elsewhere and is a condemned idea by pope pius the sixth by the way in octorum fide his uh his nonsense interpretate interpretation of things that are ambiguity is a con is a condemned proposition yeah. uh he's not He's not an honest man. He's long-winded, uh, not an impressive intellectual, and uh, and treats of a man who's been way more productive in the care of souls than he has yeah. uh, in a way that's flippant on the day that we should be praying for all souls and the day after we're yeah. celebrating all saints. This is literally in the... Uh... You know, we're basically in, it's, we're in like a, a type of triduum here for the souls. And this man has. Yeah, we are. It's, it's uh, yeah. traditionally, it's traditionally, it is a triduum. It's the That's holiday I mean. triduum. Yeah. It's there. Exactly. How, so we're in a, we're in yeah. a time now where we're supposed to be praying for the dead, honoring those who've come before us. And he takes to the social media and decides to say the following. I'm going to share this with us here. And we're going to debunk why this is it. This just shows that he's not even trying to be charitable. He's not trying to dialogue. He's not trying to do any of these things because he's lying. And he has lied about Marcel Lefebvre before. He lied about Marcel Lefebvre when he was on a show with you a couple of years ago on Tim Gordon's show when he said, uh, Michael, when he said, Nova, uh, Marcel Lefebvre said the Novus Ordo. I talked to Michael often about that and he wouldn't deny the claim. And he actually ended up blocking me uh, after I tried to talk to him again about something else because that's the kind of man he is. He runs from his fights. He picks on people from his YouTube channel. He talks about them behind his back. And then he blocks them while calling everybody else uncharitable. He is the archetype of an effeminate man in our culture today. And here is uh, what he said. He said, friendly reminder that Marcel Lefebvre died personally excommunicated by the Pope. And this excommunication has not been lifted. I'll take uh, lies by apologists online for 200, Alex. And I'm going to show why this 
actually, sorry, I'll just keep reading this and then I will show because I can't switch back and forth a thousand times between the tabs. So let's remember this. He says, Marcel Lefebvre died personally excommunicated by the Pope and this communication has not been lifted. Lie. Thus, any talk about him being a saint or a new Athanasius is inappropriate. That's just his opinion. But they said similar things about like uh, St. Joan of Arc, for example, before it was lifted and then they made her a saint. So let's just relax on that, uh, Mr. Church historian here. It would be one thing if we never he had never been in communion with Rome and was venerated since he wasn't a formal schismatic. <laughs> So, so he's actually saying if he was never actually Catholic, it'd be better. That's so what he's he saying. Said. If he was never Catholic, it would be better. That just shows you where his head's at and uh, how much disdain he has for the church. Because mm -hmm. if the church revalidates his excommunication and lifts it, then and only then can we discuss his veneration. Well, Mr. Lofton, with your uh, magisterium of Pope Michael, it has been lifted. And also, we're going to talk about um, the lies in this. So first... He says, friendly reminder that personally excommunicated. This is false. And we're going to show you why. So I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, this is a summary of what happened in 1988. And yes, it's an SSPX source. So I guess if you're a modernist and you hate tradition, then you'll probably not think the source is accurate. But if you want, you can go look them up yourself and do your own due diligence. And there's another uh, non-SSPX source. Uh for this canonical study done by Father Father Jerry Murray, uh, who, yeah, you see on, yeah. who you see on EWTM pretty often. Yeah. Uh, he comes down on the side that Lefebvre was not excommunicated. Yeah. He is the, a priest of the Archdiocese of New York, not a society priest. And he had, and he was on Pines with Aquinas, ironically. And yes, he, he had his, and he had his dissertation. That was actually his dissertation. Yes, and it, it was. was. And it was given a passing grade by Pontifical University. So I guess, but this hasn't passed the magisterium of Michael Lofton. So we have to understand that he's in a special class of his own as a YouTube saint, as a YouTube father. So in any case, this is what he's talking about. So he's talking about the excommunication of Lefebvre. So let's look at here, July 1st. Okay, because Michael Lofton's claim is that Marcel Lefebvre was personally excommunicated by the Pope. Well, this is factually wrong, and it proves that he's a dishonest intellectual and a liar at best. It says, Cardinal Ganton declared the threatened excommunication to have been occurred. He called the consecrations a schismatic act and declared uh, the corresponding excommunication, etc., etc., etc. So, <clears throat> Cardinal Ganton was the first one to say that Marcel Lefebvre excommunicated himself. And let's look at the wording here per, uh, properly. Um, the threatened excommunications to have been occurred. And why does he say the threatened excommunications to have been occurred? Because these are what's called a laetes, and that's not, it's in here. The actual term laetes intensiae. I've got to find the actual document for that. I will in a minute. But these are what's called a late sententia excommunication. So if Michael often isn't aware of how the church works, which he's clearly not, or he's a liar, a late sententia excommunication is the following. It means that you've done something and by the act itself, he's excommunicated yourself. In order for that to be valid, you have to have met the stipulations. So, for example, uh, people who procure abortions are late sententia excommunicated from the church. Now, under the current Pope, and I think even Benedict, I can't remember, but you are allowed to go to a basic confession, and it doesn't have to have bishop's approval in order for that to be lifted. It's just through the confessional. Um, but it wasn't the case in the past. But you're still excommunicated if you procure an abortion. It doesn't have to be declared. You are not personally declared excommunicated if you are late sententia excommunicated. That's another type of excommunication, which is called Ferdinand sententia. I don't know if Michael often speaks Latin, but he can look it up, and, and I'm, I'm not lying here. Uh, like he is. And a Ferdinande sentence excommunication essentially means that it's a positive excommunication. So for example, uh, Joan of Arc was excommunicated in that fashion. She was excommunicated by a hierarch of the church. I believe he was a cardinal, at least a bishop. And he said, basically, you're a witch or you're lying and this is whatever, this is a fraud. And you're excommunicated because of persisting in this. And she was put to the stake. She wasn't excommunicated late sententia because there is no church law against whatever she was doing, allegedly. He decided that she had not passed a trial and therefore was given this penalty directly and positively by this person. That's not what happened to Marcel Lefebvre. It was alleged, and we can look at these documents again here, that Marcel Lefebvre was going to occur an excommunication built into the Code of Canon Law, as we can see, 1983 Code, the 1382 Canon, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Even if those, uh, even if he met the stipulations, 
it is a bold-faced lie that John Paul II personally excommunicated him. And we're going to go and see why. So if you look at Cardinal Ganton's uh, date, it's July 1st. So that comes a day before John Paul II. John Paul II comes out a uh, day later and says in Ecclesia de Afflicta, uh, the Pope repeated Cardinal, repeated Cardinal Ganton's ex, uh, accusation of a schismatic mentality and uh, the excommunications. So hold on a sec. Let's ask. Let's ask our magisterium of Michael Lofton a question here. Does this mean Michael? Uh, does this mean ex or Marcel Lefebvre was excommunicated twice? Was he excommunicated by Cardinal Ganton on July first, and then personally excommunicated on July the second? Or perhaps Cardinal Ganton was disobeying the Pope, which is a bad thing if you're a Pope's planner, and he actually excommunicated him without the Pope giving him his approval first. It's a, you see you see the problem here. This does not match the historical reality. Nowhere in these documents does it say. I, Pope John Paul II, by the power vested in me, say that because he's a meanie poopoo head, I am excommunicating from the Catholic Church. In John Paul II's letter, you can look it up. He says a lot of, you know, big, scary sounding things, but he says he has incurred the excommunication that was threatened. Your thoughts? Well, he invokes a canon that doesn't apply, which is the uh, what we'll get into. I, you know. My uh, article for 1 Peter 5 on the Lefebvre ordeal was largely about that, um, the, uh, the excommunications themselves. Uh, what these are, what, what Lofton's comment here is, is the screeds of an angry and cowardly man. And that's all it is. So uh, it's unlettered, uh, stupid, and um, just, uh, f you know, filled with holes. For instance, he, 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 <laughs> he uses the, the comparison of St. Athanasius uh, because he sees trads doing just that. And he's like, uh, and he says, uh, we can't compare that because the excommunications of Athanasius were lifted, mm -hmm. which implies logically, uh, he doesn't seem to, he doesn't, he buries philosophy in, he tries to bury philosophy in theology and magisterium. He doesn't yeah, understand, yeah. he doesn't understand how basic yeah. rudimentary logic works. Yeah. So uh, he, uh, so he implies here that, the that Athanasius wasn't a saint in and of himself. He implies here that Athanasius was a saint because the excommunications were lifted. But yeah. Uh, yeah. you see how that you see how this follows. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. I'm actually going to bring up quickly here. I found the letter uh, from John Paul II. So let's bring it up here. Oops, here it is. This is a crazy day. Like, let's look at this. So it says, and this is I'll make it bigger. It says. Uh, uh, with great affliction, the church has learned of the awful Episcopal, unlawful, et cetera, et cetera. So Marcel Lefebvre, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and it says, go where it says, he goes, okay, have incurred the grave penalty of excommunication. So let's go down to where the citation is. Number four. He's talking about Canon 1382. Let's go to Canon 1382 of the Code of Canon Law. Okay. Hey, so, a bishop who consecrates, uh, I'll make this smaller here. So I don't know if Michael often knows how to use the internet. He's got a fancy YouTube show, but I don't know if he's very good at using Google. He says, a bishop who consecrates uh, someone, a, bish a bishop without a pontifical mandate, and the person who receives a consecration from him incur a late sententia excommunication. Okay, so let's look at that, what late sententia means, because I want to make sure that we help out Mr. Lofton, because he seems confused. I know he has a big YouTube channel, and he knows a lot of things because he, he uses big words. But even, even, even Wikipedia can say this for us. So what's Wikipedia say? Uh, late sententia means sentence already passed by the act itself. Ferdinande sententia means sentence to be passed. Okay, so late sententia penalties. Uh, unless excusing circumstances outlined in Canon 1321 and 1330, according to the 1983 code, the Canon law imposes late sententia excommunications of the following, and these are the list of them. Okay. Um, now, Let's go to what the ex the uh, the um, exceptions would be. So let's go to Canon Law 13, 1323, Code of Canon Law. Let's find that here quick. 
and the code of canon law and there you go those are the ones if you look if you go back if you missed it go back a couple seconds and it said unless it's outlined in 1321 to 1330 so let's see what what's let's see if these could apply so 1323 it says the following are not subject to a penalty when they have violated a precept or law uh and this is a person who has not yet completed his thing doesn't apply um we'll find the one that does a person who acted coerced by grave fear, even if only relative or due to necessity. People say state of necessity is not in the in the church. It is. Or grave inconvenience. That also applies to a situation because he had been given seven or eight different, or three or four different dates that kept getting. Uh, he had already been approved for bishops and he was given three or four dates that kept getting rescheduled and he was getting old and he had a, a, a severe cancer uh, developing in his, in his loins. Um. And a person who acted with due moderation against an unjust aggressor for the sake of legitimate self-defense or defense of another. With Marcel Lefebvre's claim that he was defending the priesthood, which I believe he was, and also it was unjust because, as it turns out later, we'll see that the, the excommunications are lifted. We haven't even got to that point where Lofton was saying that unless they're lifted, there's literally a document from the Vatican saying the 1988 things are no longer in effect. Like that's That means they're lifted anyway. If you go to 1324... It says the perpetrator of a violation um, is not exempt from a penalty, but the penalty established by law or precept must be tempered or a penance employed in its place. So this means you couldn't be given the excommunication, so it could be something else, if it was even there. And it says, uh, again, a person co coerced by grave fear. Um, and someone who gravely and unjustly provokes the person. Okay. Okay. Um, and it even says, I'm going uh, to try to find it here. Um, first, by grave fear, due to necessity, um, a person with, acted with, without full imputability, which also applies. Um, anyway, in the circumstances mentioned, the accused is not bound by a late sententia penalty. Okay. So this has been argued by many. Um, oh, sorry. There's the one. By a person who thought in culpable error. So this is what it says. This is what that means. Even if Lefebvre was wrong, even if he was wrong, I don't believe he was, but even if he was, which would be strange if he was wrong, considering uh, Father Murray, who is an expert on canon law, gets his pontifical university degree saying that he was, that it was, you know, invalid. Even if he was wrong, even if he was wrong about what's in four and five. So, um, even if he was wrong about the fear, even if he was wrong about the necessity, if he truly believes it, he can't be guilty for the thing that's being said. This is how the law works, people. Now, I'm not saying I believe that he was wrong. I'm just saying if we're going by the letter of the law, you can't say that it was a personal excommunication by the Pope because that's not what the law says. This is a false lying statement by a man who is not telling the truth. Everything to add before I... Uh, no, well, well said. Uh, I, I, you know, I can't think of any other justification for saying something like this other than being, um, for whatever reason, hung up on a particular program working. That is the Novus Ordo and the Vatican II uh, program. Uh, we must have some some stake in this uh, in this coming to fruition because I don't otherwise see any any justification for it. Let's, yeah, you're right. Let's look at one more thing here. So Michael Lofton said, I'll read it again. He says, if the church reevaluates its excommunication and lifts it, then only then. Oh, only then. Thank you for telling us the truth of the matter. We should listen to you, Michael Lofton, because you are a apparently a hierarch in the church who knows more than the Vatican. Only then can we discuss his veneration. That's actually completely wrong. If you know the history of the church, I am positive there are people who are talking about venerating St. Joan of Arc before it was officially lifted. Let's be honest about that. All right. So anyway. Um, it says here, we can all see this. I'll make this a little bit bigger. There you go. On the, this is from, this is not from the Pope. So it, this is, I should actually say something here. If it was true that he was personally excommunicated by the Pope, wouldn't the Pope have to lift it? I'm just, I'm, I'm actually just asking that. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I'm just asking that because this wasn't written by the Pope. Uh, it was written by Cardinal Batista prefect of the congregation for bishops. Okay, he writes this. On the basis of the powers expressly granted to me by Holy Father Benedict XVI, my, by virtue of the present decree, 
I, not the Pope, I, I remit the penalty of excommunication, late sententia. So again, if you can't find late sententia in the documents from 1988, I think they're there. But if you can't find them, they're there in 2009 under Pope Benedict. Okay, so there's an acknowledgement. Unless you think the Vatican's wrong, which I'm sure because of your super intellect that you can probably know more than the than the Pope, than multiple popes and multiple cardinals. But that's another story. It says, "I." Do you hear my kids screaming in the background? A little bit, yeah, but great. not bad. Okay, little bugger. Uh, uh, I remit the penalty of excommunication, late sententia, incurred by bishops Bernard Fillet, Tissier, Williamson, Galaretta, as declared on July 1st. Now, hold on a second there, people. Look at that date, July 1st, 1988. Um, maybe you can answer this, uh, Mr. Mr. Boca. When did John Paul II put out his letter? Uh, Was July, it July 1st or 2nd? That's a, uh, I actually, I don't know. Now I'm assuming second. It was yeah. the second. So yeah. why am I saying this? Because this is further proof that John Paul II did not level a personal excommunication. If he right. left, yeah. if, if it was leveled by, if JP2's letter was the de facto declaration of the excommunication as in a personal thing, me, Pope John Paul doing it, that would have to be lifted. But what did he lift? He lifted the one from July 1st. Which is the one from July 1st? It's from Cardinal Gantin, who wrote it on July 1st. Indicating the action itself and not... Meaning that the actual... It was a right. declaration from the Congregation for Bishops, whereas John Paul II put out a letter giving his opinion on it. Right. But it was not a declaration that I personally excommunicate Lefebvre. It was a glorified way of John Paul II saying... This seems to be what happened. That's right. So, which actually, um, funny, funnily enough, we just did our show. With, um, yeah. We just did our show with uh, Rob Morrow, Malachi Martin's yeah. friend, and he. Uh, uh, we were talking about the distinction between Thomism and phenomenology, yeah. and how Thomism is able to acknowledge um, the external reality, the objective yeah. external reality, but phenomenology, which is the philosophy of John Paul II, um, looks at a situation. Uh, and one and tries to interpret it and wonders what this phenomenon means. So, yeah, and uh, it's kind of like uh, it's kind of like the the hamster on the wheel. Um, so John Paul II's lack of precision there is actually no surprising given his philosophical tradition. And also, hey, you want to do phenomenology because you think it's interesting for I don't know contemplating the being or something. That's great, but it sucks for church. <laughs> it sucks for right. running the church. Yeah. Like again, like people will say. Uh, you could never be a phenomenologist and a Catholic. That's not true. It's just not good for governing the church. I apologize for my kids screaming in the background. There's a bunch of kids here. They're playing and he's a... Well, because law is categorical. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Um, so then uh, here's... I'm going to finish this here though. Okay. So he says... At the same time, so, he, so Lofton said, and I'll read it again, he said, if the church reevaluates his excommunication and lifts it, then, only, then and only then can we discuss his veneration. Well, guess what? The church did revisit it. So this is a stupid statement that you don't even need to make. He says, um, at the same time, I declare that as, to, as of today's date, the decree issued at the time no longer has juridical effect. Now, maybe you can interpret this secret code for us, Joe. But I'm of the opinion that if the lawgivers of the church say that a law is no longer in place, that means it no longer has effect. Can an excommunication be unlifted if it's no longer a thing? What do you think? It doesn't sound like it to me. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Very so basic. This is, there, there are so many lies. The first lie that Lefebvre, and also, here's another lie. He died personally excommunicated. Does Michael often not know how a late sentence excommunication is lifted? Do you? Does anybody? It depends on the excommunication, but one of the ways is you go to confession. So we don't even, I'm not saying he was. I'm just saying even if he was. Even if he was, how do you know, how did you read his soul? Is it, it is, it is, it is so evil for a supposed Catholic apologist who prattles on about charity and, and brother and, and, and fraternity and all this nonsense and dialogue to say he knows the state of a man's soul when he died. 
It is impossible for anyone, unless there's some sort of mystic like Padre Pio, which is shown by extraordinary miracles or something. It is impossible to know the state of a man's soul when he dies. This is absolutely, this is, this is calumny, this is detraction, and it is sinful. It is gravely sinful, especially in this hallow tide of the holy souls of the church. Lofton also said, um, any talk about him being a saint or a new Athanasius is inappropriate. No, it's not. That's there's like that's this isn't even uh, something that you could have an opinion on as far as church teaching. This is just so we have a, a statement here from Lofton mixing together his view of ecclesiology, which is false, his understanding of history, which is fictitious, his opinion about what Catholics are allowed to entertain uh, on their own, which is meaningless. And his thoughts are a resounding gong when it comes to that. And he has no understanding about what actually happened in the church and does not know when the penalties were leveled, which sort of penalties they are, and when they were lifted, which has been made obvious by the church. Anything to add? Uh, it's, you know, yet another uh, event in the, the series of events of, uh, of denying what's right in front of us. You know, we see, we see it with Pope Francis and the, the ordeal on proselytism and the cope over that. Uh, you know, it's it's surprising and unsurprising all at once, you know. As Bishop Tissier said, we don't just defend the church from enemies when they attack, but we attack the enemies when we can. Michael Lofton is an enemy of the church. And the reason I say that is because he could be doing something completely different. He's an intelligent guy. Okay. I, he can read books, I think. Uh, I've never seen him. I've never seen him read one, but I'm imagining he can. Um, he could be trying to interpret this in a way where he could have unity with traditionalists. Only but that's it, that's only for liberals and heretics. Right, well, exactly. But he could be doing that. But instead, he misrepresents church history. He misrep doesn't misrepresent. He lies about church history. He lies or is ignorant of church ecclesiology. Uh, and he lies about uh, the, 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 the facts of the matter and ignores the relevant documents and says things to people. And this is the thing. People look to this guy as if he is telling the truth. I'm going to say this right now because I don't really care how many enemies I make because I don't care if the enemies of the church like me. Um, if you have anything to do with Michael Lofton, uh, then you're also complicit. In the, and I'm not talking about, okay, you knew him from something. But if you are a friend of this guy, if you're in an apostolate with this guy, if you do shows with this guy and you just let him continue, you're not a real friend of his. He is well, doing, of course, they're going. Yeah, they're prop, they're propping him up, particularly certain people are propping him up as this intellectual savior yeah. after uh, the Diamond Castman ordeal. They all look, they all look to Michael Lofton as though he's, uh, uh, as though he's some kind of uh, going to rescue everybody from the, the big bad rat trad. And, yeah, and I could release some emails about these Michael Lofton adjacent fellows and the lies and the calumny, and I have the screenshots of everything. And I could release them about the stuff I've had to go through dealing with these people. People have no idea, and I won't, because there are people involved who, who probably don't want to have their names dragged through the mud, although they deserve it. Um, he's an enemy of the church. Michael Lofton is an enemy of the church. And anyone who does not call him out on that, who, is, who say, says they're his friend, you're not his friend. And I'm not saying I know whether you have or not. I've talked to some of his friends. Maybe they are trying to talk to him behind the scenes. I'm not saying it has to be public. I'm just saying, you know what he's doing is a lie. What we've said here is irrefutable. He's doing everything he possibly can to divide good Catholics. So anyone who's involved with this guy, if you think that you can continue to follow him, you are ignorant of church history. You are ignorant of church ecclesiology. And you yourself are contributing to the demise of relationships between good-natured Novus Ordo and traditionalists because of this fly in the ointment who is presenting himself as some sort of magisterial expert and what he does is ruins the relationships uh, of, of people of goodwill. And it would be a shame because I know Michael often is working with Catholic Answers and Catholic Answers is a wonderful organization. They were extremely important to me in my coming back to the faith. And they have been so kind and wonderful to the SSPX because they follow what the church says. And they know the church has said the things we presented in this show. It is uh, a shame that Catholic Answers is having its name sullied by such a, a despicable enemy of the church. Anything to say before we close off? I like that ending. What do you think? Am I going to be invited on Reason and Theology? Probably not anytime <laughs> soon, I'd say. Unless, unless somebody else starts to, unless somebody else hosts it. 
but uh, I don't, I don't anticipate that anytime soon. It'll stay treason in theology for now. You know, I was asked to, de- I was asked to debate someone uh, on uh, the SSPX for a major YouTube channel. And I did my best, but it fell through because the person was out there when it came to certain things. Um, and I was talking to a good friend of mine and he said, you know, it's a good thing that didn't happen. He says, do you think Archbishop Fulton Sheen would have debated modernists in public? I said, you're probably right. Why waste your time? Based full machine, base Marcel Lefebvre. Like this video, subscribe to this channel. Uh, and if you're a fan of Lofton, good luck to you. All right, this has been the Kennedy Report. Until next time, God bless.